Chapter 28 of Christ Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sunbeard. Christ Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Who is my neighbor? Based on Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Among the Jews, the question, Who is my neighbor? caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priest, the rabbi, the elder regard as their neighbor? They spent their lives in a round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude, they thought, would cause defilement that would require wearisome effort to remove. Were they to regard the unclean as neighbors? This question Christ answered in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He showed that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. The parable of the Good Samaritan was called forth by a question put to Christ by a doctor of the law. As the Savior was teaching, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The Pharisees had suggested this question to the lawyer in the hope that they might entrap Christ in his words, and they listened eagerly for his answer. But the Savior entered into no controversy. He required the answer from the questioner himself. What is written in the law? he asked. How readest thou? The Jews still accused Jesus of lightly regarding the law given from Sinai, but he turned the question of salvation upon the keeping of God's commandment. The lawyer said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Thou hast answered right, Christ said. This do, and thou shalt live. The lawyer was not satisfied with the position and works of the Pharisees. He had been studying the scriptures with a desire to learn their real meaning. He had a vital interest in the matter, and he asked in sincerity, What shall I do? In his answer as to the requirements of the law, he passed by all the mass of ceremonial and ritualistic precepts. For these he claimed no value, but presented the two great principles on which hang all the law and the prophets. The Savior's commendation of his answer placed him on a vantage ground with the rabbis. They could not condemn him for sanctioning that which had been advanced by an expositor of the law. This do, and thou shalt live, Christ said. In his teaching, he ever presented the law as a divine unity showing that it is impossible to keep one precept and break another, for the same principle runs through all. Man's destiny will be determined by his obedience to the whole law. Christ knew that no one could obey the law in his own strength. He desired to lead the lawyer to a clearer and more critical research that he might find the truth. Only by accepting the virtue and grace of Christ can we keep the law. Belief in the propitiation for sin enables fallen man to love God with his whole heart and his neighbor as himself. The lawyer knew that he had kept neither the first four nor the last six commandments. He was convicted under Christ's searching words, but instead of confessing his sin, he tried to excuse it. Rather than acknowledge the truth, he endeavored to show how difficult the fulfillment of the commandment is. Thus he hoped both to parry conviction and to vindicate himself in the eyes of the people. The Savior's words had shown that his question was needless, since he was able to answer it himself. Yet he put another question, saying, Who is my neighbor? Again, Christ refused to be drawn into controversy. He answered the question by relating an incident, the memory of which was fresh in the minds of his hearers. A certain man, he said, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveler had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea. 
the road led down a wild, rocky ravine which was infested with robbers and was often the scene of violence. It was here that the traveler was attacked, stripped of all that was valuable, and left half dead by the wayside. As he lay thus, a priest came that way. He saw the man lying wounded and bruised, weltering in his own blood, but he left him without rendering any assistance. He passed by on the other side. Then a Levite appeared. Curious to know what had happened, he stopped and looked at the sufferer. He was convicted of what he ought to do, but it was not an agreeable duty. He wished that he had not come that way, so that he would not have seen the wounded man. He persuaded himself that the case was no concern of his, and he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, traveling the same road, saw the sufferer, and he did the work that the others had refused to do. With gentleness and kindness, he ministered to the wounded man. When he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. The priest and the Levite both professed piety, but the Samaritan showed that he was truly converted. It was no more agreeable for him to do the work than for the priest and the Levite, but in spirit and works he proved himself to be in harmony with God. In giving this lesson, Christ presented the principles of the law in a direct, forcible way, showing his hearers that they had neglected to carry out these principles. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners could find no opportunity to cavil. The lawyer found in the lesson nothing that he could criticize. His prejudice in regard to Christ was removed, but he had not overcome his national dislike to sufficiently give credit to the Samaritan by name. When Christ asked, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He answered, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. Show the same tender kindness to those in need. Thus you will give evidence that you keep the whole law. The great difference between the Jews and the Samaritans was a difference in religious belief, a question as to what constitutes true worship. The Pharisees would say nothing good of the Samaritans, but poured their bitterest curses on them. So strong was the antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans that to the Samaritan woman it seemed a strange thing for Christ to ask her for a drink. How is it, she said, that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For, adds the evangelist, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And when the Jews were so filled with murderous hatred against Christ that they rose up in the temple to stone him, they could find no better words by which to express their hatred than, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast the devil? Yet the priest and the Levite neglected the very work the Lord had enjoined on them, leaving a hated and despised Samaritan to minister to one of their own countrymen. The Samaritan had fulfilled the command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, thus showing that he was more righteous than those by whom he was denounced. Risking his own life, he had treated the wounded man as his brother. The Samaritan represents Christ. Our Savior manifested for us a love that the love of man can never equal. When we were bruised and dying, he had pity on us. He did not pass by on the other side and leave us helpless and hopeless to perish. He did not remain in his holy, happy home where he was beloved by all the heavenly host. He beheld our sore need. He undertook our case and identified his interests with those of humanity. He died to save his enemies. He prayed for his murderers. Pointing to his own example, he says to his followers, These things I command you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. The priest and the Levite had been for worship to the temple, whose service was appointed by God himself. To participate in that service was a great and exalted privilege, and the priest and Levite felt that having thus been honored, it was beneath them to minister to an unknown sufferer by the wayside. Thus they neglected the special opportunity which God had offered them as his agents to bless a fellow human being. 
Many today are making a similar mistake. They separate their duties into two distinct classes. The one class is made up of great things to be regulated by the law of God. The other class is made up of so-called little things in which the command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is ignored. This sphere of work is left to caprice, subject to inclination or impulse. Thus the character is marred and the religion of Christ misrepresented. There are those who would think it lowering to their dignity to minister to suffering humanity. Many look with indifference and contempt upon those who have laid the temple of the soul in ruins. Others neglect the poor from a different motive. They are working, as they believe, in the cause of Christ, seeking to build up some worthy enterprise. They feel that they are doing a great work, and they cannot stop to notice the wants of the needy and distressed. In advancing their supposedly great work, they may even oppress the poor. They may place them in hard and trying circumstances, deprive them of their rights, or neglect their needs. Yet they feel that all this is justifiable because they are, as they think, advancing the cause of Christ. Many will allow a brother or a neighbor to struggle unaided under adverse circumstances. Because they profess to be Christians, he may be led to think that in their cold selfishness they are representing Christ. Because the Lord's professed servants are not in cooperation with him, the love of God, which should flow forth from them, is in great degree cut off from their fellow men, and a large revenue of praise and thanksgiving from human hearts and human lips is prevented from flowing back to God. He is robbed of the glory due His holy name. He is robbed of the souls for whom Christ died, souls whom He longs to bring into His kingdom, to dwell in His presence through endless ages. Divine truth exerts little influence upon the world when it should exert much influence through our practice. The mere profession of religion abounds, but it has little weight. We may claim to be followers of Christ. We may claim to believe every truth in the Word of God. But this will do our neighbor no good unless our belief is carried into our daily life. Our profession may be as high as heaven, but it will save neither ourselves nor our fellow men unless we are Christians. A right example will do more to benefit the world than all our profession. By no selfish practices can the cause of Christ be served. His cause is the cause of the oppressed and the poor. In the hearts of His professed followers, there is need of the tender sympathy of Christ, a deeper love for those whom He has so valued as to give His own life for their salvation. These souls are precious, infinitely more precious than any other offering we can bring to God to bend every energy towards some apparently great work. While we neglect the needy or turn the stranger from his right is not a service that will meet his approval. The sanctification of the soul by the working of the Holy Spirit is the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity. Gospel religion is Christ in the life, a living, active principle. It is the grace of Christ revealed in character and wrought out in good works. The principles of the gospel cannot be disconnected from any department of practical life. Every line of Christian experience and labor is to be a representation of the life of Christ. Love is the basis for godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. But we can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, love springs forth spontaneously. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. When the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance, it is not possible for the heart in which Christ abides to be destitute of love. If we love God because He first loved us, we shall love all for whom Christ died. We cannot come in touch with divinity without coming in touch with humanity. For in Him who sits upon the throne of the universe, divinity and humanity are combined. Connected with Christ, we are connected with our fellow men by the golden links of the chain of love. Then the pity and compassion of Christ will be manifest in our life. We shall not wait to have the needy and unfortunate brought to us. We shall not need to be entreated to feel for the woes of others. It will be as natural for us to minister to the needy and suffering 
as it was for Christ to go about doing good. Wherever there is an impulse of love and sympathy, wherever the heart reaches out to bless and uplift others, there is revealed the working of God's Holy Spirit. In the depths of heathenism, men who have had no knowledge of the written law of God, who have never heard the name of Christ, have been kind to his servants, protecting them at the risk of their own lives. Their acts show the working of a divine power. The Holy Spirit has implanted the grace of Christ in the heart of the savage, quickening his sympathies contrary to his nature, contrary to his education. The light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world is shining in his soul. And this light, if heeded, will guide his feet to the kingdom of God. The glory of heaven is lifting up the fallen, comforting the distressed. And wherever Christ abides in human hearts, he will be revealed in the same way. Wherever it acts, the religion of Christ will bless. Wherever it works, there is brightness. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad and deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's circle the poor souls who have been deluded by his deceptions. It places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free. All are brought nigh by his precious blood. Whatever the difference in religious belief, a call from suffering humanity must be heard and answered. Where bitterness of feeling exists because of difference in religion, much good may be done by personal service. Loving ministry will break down prejudice and win souls to God. We should anticipate the sorrows and difficulties, the troubles of others. We should enter into the joys and cares of both high and low, rich and poor. Freely ye have received, Christ says, freely give. All around us are poor, tried souls that need sympathizing words and helpful deeds. There are widows who need sympathy and assistance. There are orphans whom Christ has bidden his followers receive as a trust from God. Too often, these are passed by with neglect. They may be ragged, uncouth, and seemingly in every way unattractive, yet they are God's property. They have been bought with a price, and they are as precious in His sight as we are. They are members of God's great household, and Christians, as His stewards, are responsible for them. Their souls, He says, will I require at Thy hand. Sin is the greatest of all evils, and it is ours to pity and help the sinner. But not all can be reached in the same way. There are many who hide their soul hunger. These would be greatly helped by a tender word or a kind remembrance. There are others who are in their greatest need, yet they know it not. They do not realize the terrible destitution of the soul. Multitudes are so sunken in sin that they have lost the sense of eternal realities, lost the similitude of God, and they hardly know whether they have souls to be saved or not. They have neither faith in God nor confidence in man. Many of these can be reached only through acts of disinterested kindness. Their physical wants must first be cared for. They must be fed, cleansed, and decently clothed. As they see the evidence of your unselfish love, it will be easier for them to believe in the love of Christ. There are many who err and who feel their shame and their folly. They look upon their mistakes and errors and they are driven almost to desperation. These souls we are not to neglect. When one has to swim against the stream, there is all the force of the current driving him back. Let a helping hand then be held out to him as was the elder brother's hand to the sinking Peter. Speak to him hopeful words, words that will establish confidence and awaken love. Thy brother, sick in spirit, needs thee as thou thyself has needed a brother's love. He needs the experience of one who has been as weak as he, one who can sympathize with him and help him. The knowledge of our own weakness should help us to help another in his bitter need. Never should we pass by one suffering soul without seeking to impart to him the comfort wherewith we are comforted of God. 
It is fellowship with Christ, personal contact with a living Savior that enables the mind and heart and soul to triumph over the lower nature. Tell the wanderer of the Almighty hand that will hold him up, of an infinite humanity in Christ that pities him. It is not enough for him to believe in law and force, things that have no pity, and never hear the cry for help. He needs to clasp a hand that is warm, to trust in a heart full of tenderness. Keep his mind stayed upon the thought of a divine presence ever beside him, ever looking upon him with pitying love. Bid him think of the Father's heart that ever grieves over sin, of a Father's hand stretched out still, of a Father's voice saying, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace. As you engage in this work, you have companions unseen by human eyes. Angels of heaven were beside the Samaritan who cared for the wounded stranger. Angels from the heavenly courts stand by all who do God's service in ministering to their fellow men. And you have the cooperation of Christ Himself. He is the Restorer, and as you work under His supervision, you will see great results. Upon your faithfulness in this work, not only the well-being of others, but your own eternal destiny depends. Christ is seeking to uplift all who have been lifted to companionship with Himself, that we may be one with Him as He is one with the Father. He permits us to come in contact with suffering and calamity in order to call us out of our selfishness. He seeks to develop in us the attributes of His character, compassion, tenderness, and love. By accepting this work of ministry, we place ourselves in His school to be fitted for the courts of God. By rejecting it, we reject His instruction and choose eternal separation from His presence. If thou wilt keep my charge, the Lord declares, I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by, even among the angels that surround His throne. By cooperating with heavenly beings in their work on earth, we are preparing for their companionship in heaven. Ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Angels in heaven will welcome those who on earth have lived not to be ministered unto, but to minister. In this blessed companionship, we shall learn to our eternal joy all that is wrapped up in the question, Who is my neighbor? End of chapter 28. Who is my neighbor? Chapter 29 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 29. The Reward of Grace. The truth of God's free grace had been almost lost sight of by the Jews. The rabbis taught that God's favor must be earned. The reward of the righteous they hoped to gain by their own works. Thus, their worship was prompted by a grasping, mercenary spirit. From this spirit, even the disciples of Christ were not wholly free, and the Saviour sought every opportunity of showing them their error. Just before he gave the parable of the labourers, an event occurred that opened the way for him to present the right principles. As he was walking by the way, a young ruler came running to him, and, kneeling, reverently saluted him. "'Good master,' he said, "'what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life?' The ruler had addressed Christ merely as an honoured rabbi, not discerning in him the Son of God. The Saviour said, "'Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. On what ground do you call me good? God is the one good. If you recognise me as such, you must receive me as his Son and representative.' If thou wilt enter into life, he added, keep the commandments. The character of God is expressed in his law, and in order for you to be in harmony with God, the principles of his law must be the spring of your every action. Christ does not lessen the claims of the law. In unmistakable language, he presents obedience to it as the condition of eternal life, the same condition that was required of Adam before his fall. The Lord expects no less of the soul now than he expected of man in paradise, perfect obedience, unblemished righteousness. The requirement under the covenant of grace is just as broad as the requirement made in Eden, harmony with God's law, which is holy, just, and good. To the words, keep the commandments, 
the young man answered, Which? He supposed that some ceremonial precept was meant, but Christ was speaking of the law given from Sinai. He mentioned several commandments from the second table of the Decalogue, then summoned them all up in the precept, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man answered without hesitation, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? His conception of the law was external and superficial. Judged by a human standard, he had preserved an unblemished character. To a great degree, his outward life had been free from guilt. He verily thought that his obedience had been without a flaw. Yet he had a secret fear that all was not right between his soul and God. This prompted the question, What lack I yet? If thou wilt be perfect, Christ said, Go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The lover of self is a transgressor of the law. This Jesus desired to reveal to the young man, and he gave him a test that would make manifest the selfishness of his heart. He showed him the plague spot in his character. The young man desired no further enlightenment. He had cherished an idol in the soul. The world was his God. He professed to have kept the commandments, but he was destitute of the principle which is the very spirit and life of them all. He did not possess true love for God or man. This want was the want of everything that would qualify him to enter the kingdom of heaven. In his love of self and worldly gain, he was out of harmony with the principles of heaven. When this young ruler came to Jesus, his sincerity and earnestness won the Saviour's heart. He, beholding him, loved him. In this young man he saw one who might do service as a preacher of righteousness. He would have received this talented and noble youth as readily as he received the poor fisherman who followed him. Had the young man devoted his ability to the work of saving souls, he might have become a diligent and successful labourer for Christ. But first he must accept the conditions of discipleship. He must give himself unreservedly to God. At the Saviour's call, John, Peter, Matthew and their companions left all, rose up and followed him. The same consecration was required of the young ruler, and in this Christ did not ask a greater sacrifice than he himself had made. He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The young man had only to follow where Christ led the way. Christ looked upon the young man and longed after his soul, he longed to send him forth as a messenger of blessing to men. In the place of that which he called upon him to surrender, Christ offered him the privilege of companionship with himself. Follow me, he said. This privilege had been counted a joy by Peter, James, and John. The young man himself looked upon Christ with admiration. His heart was drawn toward the Saviour. But he was not ready to accept the Saviour's principle of self-sacrifice. He chose his riches before Jesus. He wanted eternal life, but would not receive into the soul that unselfish love which alone is life, and with a sorrowful heart he turned away from Christ. As the young man turned away, Jesus said to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God! These words astonished the disciples. They had been taught to look upon the rich as the favourites of heaven. Worldly power and riches they themselves hoped to receive in the Messiah's kingdom. If the rich were to fail of entering the kingdom, what hope could there be for the rest of men? Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. Now they realized that they themselves were included in the solemn warning. In the light of the Saviour's words, their own secret longing for power and riches was revealed. With misgivings for themselves, they exclaimed, Who then can be saved? Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. A rich man, as such, cannot enter heaven. His wealth gives him no title to the inheritance of the saints in light. It is only through unmerited grace of Christ that any man can find entrance into the city of God. 
to the rich no less than to the poor are the words of the holy spirit spoken ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price when men believe this their possessions will be held as a trust to be used as god shall direct for the saving of the lost and the comfort of the suffering and the poor with man this is impossible for the heart clings to its earthly treasure the soul that is bound in service to mammon is deaf to the cry of human need but with god all things are possible by beholding the matchless love of christ the selfish heart will be melted and subdued the rich man will be led as was saul the pharisee to say what things were gain to me those i counted loss for christ yea doubtless and i count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord then they will not count anything their own they will joy to regard themselves as stewards of the manifold grace of god and for his sake servants of all men peter was the first to rally from the secret conviction wrought by the saviour's words he thought with satisfaction of what he and his brethren had given up for christ behold he said we have forsaken all and followed thee remembering the conditional promise to the young ruler thou shalt have treasure in heaven he now asked what he and his companions were to receive as a reward for their sacrifices the saviour's answer thrilled the hearts of those galilean fishermen it pictured honours that fulfilled their highest dreams verily i say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit in the throne of his glory ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel and he added there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life but peter's question what shall we have therefore had revealed a spirit that, uncorrected, would unfit the disciples to be messengers for Christ. For it was the spirit of a hireling. While they had been attracted by the love of Jesus, the disciples were not wholly free from Pharisaism. They still worked with the thought of meriting a reward in proportion to their labour. They cherished a spirit of self-exaltation and self-complacency, and made comparisons among themselves when one of them failed in any particular the others indulged feelings of superiority lest the disciples should lose sight of the principles of the gospel christ related to them a parable illustrating the manner in which god deals with his servants and the spirit in which he desires them to labour for him the kingdom of heaven he said is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire labourers into his vineyard it was the custom for men seeking employment to wait in the market-places and thither the employers went to find servants the man in the parable is represented as going out at different hours to engage workmen those who are hired at the earliest hours agree to work for a stated sum those hired later leave their wages to the discretion of the householder so when even was come the lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward call the labourers and give them their hire beginning from the last unto the first and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour they received every man a penny but when the first came they supposed that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny the householders dealing with the workers in his vineyard represents god dealing with the human family it is contrary to the customs that prevail among men in worldly business compensation is given according to the work accomplished the labourer expects to be paid only that which he earns but in the parable christ was illustrating the principles of his kingdom a kingdom not of this world he is not controlled by any human standard the lord says my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts in the parable the first labourers agreed to work for a stipulated sum and they received the amount specified nothing more those hired later believed the master's promise whatsoever is right that shall ye receive they showed their confidence in him by asking no question in regard to wages they trusted to his justice and equity they were rewarded not according to the amount of their labour but according to the generosity of his purpose 
so God desires us to trust him who justifieth the ungodly. His reward is given, not according to our merit, but according to his own purpose, which he purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us. And for those who trust in him, he will do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Not the amount of labor performed or its visible results, but the spirit in which the work is done makes it of value with God. Those who came into the vineyard at the eleventh hour were thankful for an opportunity to work. Their hearts were full of gratitude to the one who had accepted them. And when at the close of the day the householder paid them for a full day's work, they were greatly surprised. They knew they had not earned such wages. And the kindness expressed in the countenance of their employer filled them with joy. They never forgot the goodness of the householder or the generous compensation they had received. Thus it is with the sinner, who, knowing his unworthiness, has entered the master's vineyard at the eleventh hour. His time of service seems so short. He feels that he is undeserving of reward, but he is filled with joy that God has accepted him at all. He works with a humble, trusting spirit, thankful for the privilege of being a co-worker with Christ. This spirit God delights to honour. The Lord desires us to rest in him without a question as to our measure of reward. When Christ abides in the soul, the thought of reward is not uppermost. This is not the motive that actuates our service. It is true that, in a subordinate sense, we should have respect to the recompense of reward. God desires us to appreciate his promised blessings. But he would not have us eager for rewards, nor feel that for every duty we must receive compensation. We should not be so anxious to gain the reward as to do what is right, irrespective of all gain love to god and to our fellow men should be our motive this parable does not excuse those who hear the first call to labor but who neglect to enter the lord's vineyard when the householder went to the market-place at the eleventh hour and found men unemployed he said why stand ye here all day idle the answer was because no man hath hired us none of those called later in the day were there in the morning they had not refused the call those who refuse and afterward repent do well to repent but it is not safe to trifle with the first call of mercy when the labourers in the vineyard received every man a penny those who had begun work early in the day were offended had they not worked for twelve hours they reasoned and was it not right that they should receive more than those who had worked for only one hour in the cooler part of the day these last have wrought but one hour they said and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. Friend, the householder replied to one of them, I did thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So shall the last be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. The first labourers of the parable represent those who, because of their services, claim preference above others. They take up their work in a self-gratulatory spirit, and do not bring into it self-denial and sacrifice. They may have professed to serve God all their lives. They may have been foremost in enduring hardship, privation, and trial, and they therefore think themselves entitled to a large reward. They think more of the reward than of the privilege of being servants of Christ. In their view, labours and sacrifices entitle them to receive honour above others, and because this claim is not recognised, they are offended. Did they bring into their work a loving, trusting spirit, they would continue to be first, but their querulous, complaining disposition is unchristlike and proves them to be unworthy. It reveals their desire for self-advancement, their distrust of God, and their jealous, grudging spirit towards their brethren. The Lord's goodness and liberality is to them only an occasion of murmuring. Thus they show that there is no connection between their souls and God. They do not know the joy of cooperation with the master worker. There is nothing more offensive to God than this narrow, self-caring spirit. He cannot work with any who manifest these attributes. They are insensible to the working of his spirit. The Jews had been first called into the Lord's vineyard and because of this they were proud and self-righteous. Their long years of service they regarded as entitling them to receive a larger reward than others. Nothing was more exasperating to them than an intimation that Gentiles were to be admitted to equal privileges with themselves in the things of God. 
christ warned the disciples who had been first called to follow him lest the same evil should be cherished among them he saw that the weakness the curse of the church would be a spirit of self-righteousness men would think they could do something toward earning a place in the kingdom of heaven they would imagine that when they have made certain advancement the lord would come in to help them thus there would be an abundance of self and little of jesus many who had made a little advancement would be puffed up and think themselves superior to others they would be eager for flattery jealous if not thought most important against this danger christ seeks to guard his disciples all boasting of merit in ourselves is out of place let not the wise man glory in his wisdom neither let the mighty man glory in his might let not the rich man glory in his riches but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that i am the lord which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight saith the lord the reward is not of works lest any man should boast but it is all of grace what shall we say then that abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found for if abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory but not before god for what saith the scripture abraham believed god and it was counted unto him for righteousness now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness therefore there is no occasion for one to glory over another or to grudge against another no one is privileged above another nor can any one claim the reward as a right the first and the last are to be sharers in the great eternal reward and the first should gladly welcome the last he who grudges the reward to another forgets that he himself is saved by grace alone the parable of the laborers rebukes all jealousy and suspicion love rejoices in the truth and institutes no envious comparisons he who possesses love compares only the loveliness of christ and his own imperfect character this parable is a warning to all laborers however long their service however abundant their labors that without love to their brethren without humility before god they are nothing there is no religion in the enthronement of self he who makes self-glorification his aim will find himself destitute of that grace which alone can make him efficient in christ's service whenever pride and self-complacency are indulged the work is marred it is not the length of time we labor but our willingness and fidelity in the work that makes it acceptable to god in all our service a full surrender of self is demanded the smallest duty done in sincerity and self-forgetfulness is more pleasing to god than the greatest work when marred with self-seeking he looks to see how much of the spirit of christ we cherish and how much of the likeness of christ our work reveals he regards more the love and faithfulness with which we work than the amount we do only when selfishness is dead when strife for supremacy is banished when gratitude fills the heart and love makes fragrant the life it is only then that christ is abiding in the soul and we are recognized as laborers together with god however trying their labor the true workers do not regard it as drudgery they are ready to spend and be spent but it is a cheerful work done with a glad heart joy in god is expressed through jesus christ their joy is the joy set before christ to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work they are in cooperation with the lord of glory this thought sweetens all toil it braces the will it nerves the spirit for whatever may befall working with unselfish heart ennobled by being partakers of christ's sufferings sharing his sympathies and cooperating with him in his labor they help to swell the tide of his joy and bring honor and praise to his exalted name this is the spirit of all true service for god through a lack of this spirit many who appear to be first will become last while those who possess it though accounted last will become first there are many who have given themselves to christ yet who see no opportunity for doing a large work or making a great sacrifice in his service these may find comfort in the thought that it is not necessarily the martyr's self-surrender which is most acceptable to god it may not be the missionary who has daily faced danger and death that stands highest in heaven's records the christian who is such in his private life in the daily surrender of self 
in sincerity of purpose and purity of thought in meekness under provocation in faith and piety in fidelity in that which is least the one who in the home life represents the character of christ such a one may in the sight of god be more precious than even the world-renowned missionary or martyr oh how different are the standards by which god and men measure character god sees many temptations resisted of which the world and even near friends never know temptations in the home in the heart he sees the soul's humility in view of its own weakness the sincere repentance over even a thought that is evil he sees the whole-hearted devotion to his service he has noted the hours of hard battle with self battle that won the victory all this god and angels know a book of remembrance is written before him for them that fear the lord and that think upon his name not in our learning not in our position not in our numbers or entrusted talents not in the will of man is to be found the secret of success feeling our inefficiency we are to contemplate christ and through him who is the strength of all strength the thought of all thought the willing and obedient will gain victory after victory and however short our service or humble our work if in simple faith we follow christ we shall not be disappointed in the reward that which even the greatest and wisest cannot earn the weakest and most humble may receive heaven's golden gate opens not to the self-exalted it is not lifted up to the proud in spirit but the everlasting portals will open wide to the trembling touch of a little child blessing will be the recompense of grace to those who have wrought for god in the simplicity of faith and love end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of christ's object lessons this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by beth thomas christ's object lessons by ellen g white chapter thirty to meet the bridegroom christ with his disciples is seated upon the mount of olives the sun has set behind the mountains and the heavens are curtained with the shades of evening in full view is a dwelling-house lighted up brilliantly as if for some festive scene the light streams from the openings and an expectant company wait around indicating that a marriage procession is soon to appear in many parts of the east wedding festivities are held in the evening the bridegroom goes forth to meet his bride and bring her to his home by torchlight the bridal party proceed from her father's house to his own where a feast is provided for the invited guests in the scene upon which christ looks a company are awaiting the appearance of the bridal party intending to join the procession lingering near the bride's house are ten young women robed in white each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon for oil all are anxiously watching for the appearance of the bridegroom but there is a delay hour after hour passes the watchers become weary and fall asleep at midnight the cry is heard behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him the sleepers suddenly awaking spring to their feet they see the procession moving on bright with torches and glad with music they hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride the ten maidens seize their lamps and begin to trim them in haste to go forth but five have neglected to fill their flasks with oil they did not anticipate so long a delay and they have not prepared for the emergency in distress they appeal to their wiser companions saying give us of your oil for our lamps are going out but the waiting five with their freshly trimmed lamps have emptied their flagons they have no oil to spare and they answer not so lest there be not enough for us and you but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves while they went to buy the procession moved on and left them behind the five with lighted lamps joined the throng and entered the house with the bridal train and the door was shut when the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall they received an unexpected denial the master of the feast declared i know you not they were left standing without in the empty street in the blackness of the night as christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom he told his disciples the story of the ten virgins by their experience illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming the two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their lord 
they are called virgins because they profess a pure faith by the lamps is represented the word of god the psalmist says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path the oil is a symbol of the holy spirit thus the spirit is represented in the prophecy of zechariah the angel that talked with me came again he says and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me what seest thou and i said i have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof so i answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying what are these my lord then he answered and spake unto me saying this is a word of the lord unto zerubbabel saying not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the lord of hosts and i answered again and said unto him what be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves then said he these are the two anointed ones that stand by the lord of the whole earth from the two olive trees the golden oil was emptied through the golden pipes into the bowl of the candlestick and thence into the golden lamps that give light to the sanctuary so from the holy ones that stand in god's presence his spirit is imparted to the human instrumentalities who are consecrated to his service the mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate to god's people that heavenly grace which alone can make his word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the lord of hosts in the parable all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom all had lamps and vessels for oil for a time there was seen no difference between them so with the church that lives just before christ's second coming all have a knowledge of the scriptures all have heard the message of christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing but as in the parable so it is now a time of waiting intervenes faith is tried and when the cry is heard behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him many are unready they have no oil in their vessels with their lamps they are destitute of the holy spirit without the spirit of god a knowledge of his word is of no avail the theory of truth unaccompanied by the holy spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart one may be familiar with the commands and promises of the bible but unless the spirit of god sets the truth home the character will not be transformed without the enlightenment of the spirit men will not be able to distinguish truth from error and they will fall under the masterful temptations of satan the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites they have a regard for the truth they have advocated the truth they are attracted to those who believe the truth but they have not yielded themselves to the holy spirit's working they have not fallen upon the rock christ jesus and permitted their old nature to be broken up this class are represented also by the stony ground hearers they receive the word with readiness but they fail of assimilating its principles its influence is not abiding the spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent implanting in him a new nature but the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work they do not know god they have not studied his character they have not held communion with him therefore they do not know how to trust how to look and live their service to god degenerates into a form they come unto thee as the people cometh and they sit before thee as my people and they hear thy words but they will not do them for with their mouth they show much love but their heart goeth after their covetousness the apostle paul points out that this will be the special characteristic of those who live just before christ's second coming he says in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof this is the class that in time of peril are found crying peace and safety they lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger when startled from their lethargy they discern their destitution and entreat others to supply their lack but in spiritual things no man can make up another's deficiency the grace of god has been freely offered to every soul the message of the gospel has been heralded let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely 
but character is not transferable no man can believe for another no man can receive the spirit for another no man can impart to another the character which is the fruit of the spirit's working though noah daniel and job were in it the land as i live saith the lord they shall deliver neither son nor daughter they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness it is in a crisis that character is revealed when the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him and the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers it was seen who had made preparation for the event both parties were taken unawares but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation so now a sudden and unlooked-for calamity something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of god it will show whether the soul is sustained by grace the great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied the ten virgins are watching in the evening of this earth's history all claim to be christians all have a call a name a lamp and all profess to be doing god's service all apparently wait for christ's appearing but five are unready five will be found surprised dismayed outside the banquet hall at the final day many will claim admission to christ's kingdom saying we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets lord lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works but the answer is i tell you i know ye not whence ye are depart from me in this life they have not entered into fellowship with christ therefore they know not the language of heaven they are strangers to its joy what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man which is in him even so the things of god knoweth no man but the spirit of god saddest of all words that ever fell on mortal ear are those words of doom i know you not the fellowship of the spirit which you have slighted could alone make you one with the joyous throng at the marriage feast in that scene you cannot participate its light would fall on blinded eyes its melody upon deaf ears its love and joy could awake no chord of gladness in the world benumbed heart you are shut out from heaven by your own unfitness for its companionship we cannot be ready to meet the lord by waking when the cry is heard behold the bridegroom and then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished we cannot keep christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven in the parable the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching it helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honour shining out in the darkness it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom to the marriage feast so the followers of christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world through the holy spirit god's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver by implanting in their hearts the principles of his word the holy spirit develops in men the attributes of god the light of his glory his character is to shine forth in his followers thus they are to glorify god to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home to the city of god to the marriage supper of the lamb the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight the darkest hour so the coming of christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history the days of noah and lot picture the condition of the world just before the coming of the son of man the scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness his working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness the multitudinous errors heresies and delusions of these last days not only is satan leading the world captive but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our lord jesus christ the great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight impenetrable as sackcloth of hair to god's people it will be a night of trial a night of weeping a night of persecution for the truth's sake but out of that night of darkness god's light will shine he causes the light to shine out of darkness when the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters and god said let there be light and there was light so in the night of spiritual darkness god's word goes forth let there be light 
To his people he says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold, says the scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. This is the work outlined by the prophet Isaiah in the words, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his work before him. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. Christ, the outshining of the Father's glory, came to the world as its light. He came to represent God to men, and of him it is written that he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, and went about doing good. In the synagogue at Nazareth he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the broken-hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This was the work he commissioned his disciples to do. Ye are the light of the world, he said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is the work which the prophet Isaiah describes when he said, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hidest not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Thus in the night of spiritual darkness, God's glory is to shine forth through his church in lifting up the bowed down and comforting those that mourn. All around us are heard the wails of a world's sorrow. On every hand are the needy and distressed. It is ours to aid in relieving and softening life's hardships and misery. Practical work will have far more effect than mere sermonizing. We are to give food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and shelter to the homeless. And we are called to do more than this. The wants of the soul only the love of Christ can satisfy. If Christ is abiding in us, our hearts will be full of divine sympathy. The sealed fountains of earnest, Christ-like love will be unsealed. God calls not only for our gifts for the needy, but for our cheerful countenance, our hopeful words, our kindly hand-clasp. When Christ healed the sick, he laid his hands upon them. So should we come in close touch with those whom we seek to benefit. There are many from whom hope has departed. Bring back the sunshine to them. Many have lost their courage. Speak to them words of cheer. Pray for them. There are those who need the bread of life. Read to them from the word of God. Upon many is a soul sickness which no earthly balm can reach nor physician heal. Pray for these souls. Bring them to Jesus. Tell them that there is a balm in Gilead and a physician there. Light is a blessing, a universal blessing, pouring forth its treasures on a world unthankful, unholy, demoralized. So it is with the light of the sun of righteousness. The whole earth, wrapped as it is in the darkness of sin and sorrow and pain, is to be lighted with the knowledge of God's love. From no sect, rank or class of people is the light shining from heaven's throne to be excluded. The message of hope and mercy is to be carried to the ends of the earth. Whosoever will may reach forth and take hold of God's strength and make peace with him, and he shall make peace. No longer are the heathen to be wrapped in midnight darkness. 
the gloom is to disappear before the bright beams of the sun of righteousness the power of hell has been overcome but no man can impart that which he himself has not received in the work of god humanity can originate nothing no man can by his own effort make himself a light-bearer for god it was the golden oil emptied by the heavenly messengers into the golden tubes to be conducted from the golden bowl into the lamps of the sanctuary that produced a continuous bright and shining light it is the love of god continually transferred to man that enables him to impart light into the hearts of all who are united to god by faith the golden oil of love flows freely to shine out again in good works in real heartfelt service for god in the great and measureless gift of the holy spirit are contained all of heaven's resources it is not because of any restriction on the part of god that the riches of his grace do not flow earthward to men if all were willing to receive all would become filled with his spirit it is the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which god can communicate to the world the treasures of his grace the unsearchable riches of christ there is nothing that christ desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and character there is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the saviour's love all heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and blessing to human hearts christ has made every provision that his church shall be a transformed body illumined with the light of the world possessing the glory of emmanuel it is his purpose that every christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace he desires that we shall reveal his own joy in our lives the indwelling of the spirit will be shown by the outflowing of heavenly love the divine fullness will flow through the consecrated human agent to be given forth to others the sun of righteousness has healing in his wings so from every true disciple is to be diffused an influence for life courage helpfulness and true healing the religion of christ means more than the forgiveness of sins it means taking away our sins and filling the vacuum with the graces of the holy spirit it means divine illumination rejoicing in god it means a heart emptied of self and blessed with the abiding presence of christ when christ reigns in the soul there is purity freedom from sin the glory the fullness the completeness of the gospel plan is fulfilled in the life the acceptance of the saviour brings a glow of perfect peace perfect love perfect assurance the beauty and fragrance of the character of christ revealed in the life testifies that god has indeed sent his son into the world to be its saviour christ does not bid his followers strive to shine he says let your light shine if you have received the grace of god the light is in you remove the obstructions and the lord's glory will be revealed the light will shine forth to penetrate and dispel the darkness you cannot help shining within the range of your influence the revelation of his own glory in the form of humanity will bring heaven so near to men that the beauty adorning the inner temple will be seen in every soul in whom the saviour dwells men will be captivated by the glory of an abiding christ and in currents of praise and thanksgiving from the many souls thus won to god glory will flow back to the great giver arise shine for thy light is come and the glory of the lord is risen upon thee to those who go out to meet the bridegroom is this message given christ is coming with power and great glory he is coming with his own glory and with the glory of the father he is coming with all the holy angels with him while all the world is plunged in darkness there will be a light in every dwelling of the saints they will catch the first light of his second appearing the unsullied light will shine from his splendour and christ the redeemer will be admired by all who have served him while the wicked flee from his presence christ's followers will rejoice the patriarch job looking down to the time of christ's second advent said whom i shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not a stranger to his faithful followers christ has been a daily companion and a familiar friend they have lived in close contact in close communion with god upon them the glory of the lord has risen in them the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ has been reflected 
now they rejoice in the undimmed rays of the brightness and glory of the king in his majesty they are prepared for the communion of heaven for they have heaven in their hearts with uplifted heads with the bright beams of the sun of righteousness shining upon them with rejoicing that their redemption draweth nigh they go forth to meet the bridegroom saying lo this is our god we have waited for him and he will save us and i heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings saying alleluia for the lord god omnipotent reigneth let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and he saith unto me write blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb he is lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of christ's object lessons this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by J. L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 31 The Marriage Feast. Ascend, beloved, to the joy, the festal day has come. To night the Lamb doth feast his own, to night he with his bride sits down, to night puts on the spousal crown in the great upper room. Ascend, beloved, to the love, this is the day of days. To night the bridal song is sung, to night ten thousand harps are strung in sympathy with heart and tongue unto the lamb's high praise the festal lamps are lighting now in the great marriage hall by angel hands the board is spread by angel hands the sacred bread is on the golden table laid the king his own doth call the gems are gleaming from the roof like stars in night's round dome the festal wreaths are hanging there the festal fragrance fills the air and flowers of heaven divinely fair unfold their happy bloom long long deferred now come at last the lamb's glad wedding day the guests are gathering to the feast the seats in heavenly order placed the royal throne above the rest how bright the new array sorrow and sighing are no more the weeping hours are past to-night the waiting will be done to-night the wedding robe put on the glory and the joy begun the crown has come at last without within is light is light around above is love we enter to go out no more, we raise the song unsung before, we doff the sackcloth that we wore, for all is joy above. Ascend, beloved, to the life, our days of death are o'er. Mortality has done its worst, the fetters of the tomb are burst, the last has now become the first for ever, evermore. Ascend, beloved, to the feast, make haste, thy day has come. Thrice blessed are they the Lamb doth call to share the heavenly festival in the new Salem Palace Hall, our everlasting home. Bonar. End of chapter 31. End of Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White.